Welcome to the State of the Nation. With me today, Dr. Leon Schreiber from the Democratic Alliance, Head of Strategy and Communication. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. Yeah, and we've just uh, done our, our, our live, first live breakfast in a while where we uh, discussed uh, the, the issue around coalitions and uh, had a few uh, luminaries from other parties, uh, Herman Mashaba from Action SA and Musi Maimani from Build One South Africa. Um, you know, we had Corne Mulder from Freedom Front Plus. We heard a few views on where South Africa is going and, and the, out, the, the, the prospects for the coalition. Yeah. Got off to a bit of a bumpy start. There's uh, some of the people that were on stage. We had, uh, as I said, um, um, Herman Mashaba from Action SA and Charles Salias from Patriotic Alliance that um, definitely uh, seem to have legacy from interactions with the Democratic Alliance. Well, Mike, I think there's a lot to be said about that, so I'll, I'll try to sort of make it uh, logical. I think the first point to be made is that it is now at a turning point for South Africa where we need to move into a new chapter of the kind of cooperation that we've seen before. And that is really the design behind the Moonshot Pact, where uh, we as the DA are working with uh, leaders in other parties to get around the table and actually iron out some of these issues, but most importantly, actually look forward to next year's election and say to each other, yes, there are disagreements, but what are the basic fundamental things we do actually agree on? And can we mold that into a credible offer to the voters of South Africa to say that should the voters put us as the pact in a position to form a government next year, here are some of the key things that you can expect from us in terms of addressing the issues that, that you are facing. So I don't think it's helpful to have conversations where we focus on things that matter to politicians, frankly. And there's a lot of bickering and a lot of things that uh, you can go back and, and sort of relitigate the past. I don't think that's what voters care about. What the people of South Africa care about is politicians who talk about the thing that matters to them. And we have no shortage of, of those issues. We have the load shedding crisis. We have unemployment. We have a crime uh, rate that somehow continues to, to, to spiral up. I mean, it's hard to believe. Um, you know, we're facing issues in education and health. Those are the things that, from the DA's point of view, we'd really like the pact to start talking about. And yes, close the door on some of those uh, other sort of things that matter to politicians, because we really have to talk about what matters to the people. Because we've... we've got to acknowledge that uh, the ANC could not be doing a worse job. It's, it's almost impossible. But yet it seems like the opposition party sometimes still, still struggle to, uh, to, to, to not view each other as the enemy. Yes, and I think that that's exactly right. The, the problem is when we expend resources on en and energy on fighting with each other rather than fighting against the real problem. And as you say, that is, you know, decades of ANC misrule. And especially in a context where we're facing a potentially, you know, what we've called the doomsday scenario, where you may have the ANC actually uh, partnering with the EFF after next year's election. And, you know, you say it's hard to imagine the ANC doing worse. I would venture then they would probably do worse. So we face a very real threat. There's a very real risk to South Africa's future, not only through the continuation of the, the ANC misrule that we know, but potentially even adding on top of that, you know, the EFF into the mix, as we see in a place like Johannesburg uh, and Ekuruleni already. So it really is time for us to, to realize the urgency of that situation. And if that prospect of South Africa continuing its slide even further into crisis does not galvanize us into saying, look, whatever disagreements we have amongst each other is frankly petty and meaningless compared to a, a country that is in crisis. And that is really what uh, DA leader John Stiernazen uh, put on the table with his speech uh, after the DA's Congress to say we are now going to do something that's never been tried before. And I think within that there is some hope. You know, the definition of insanity is constantly doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And that would be, you know, small parties bickering with each other, you know, opposition fighting. We are trying to do something different. We've put on the table this pact. We are grateful for parties that are engaging in a forthright way with us. And we've been able to announce the convention taking place in August to try and, and hammer out an agreement that we can say to the people of South Africa, here is not only opposition parties, here is an alternative government. Now, let's go back to when John announced the Moonshot Pact. And uh, you um, are involved in the communication and strategy. He, 
the the way he did it seemed to be uh, it it was it was quite inflammatory, in my opinion. Okay, so, know, so so in he, what way? Yeah, he, John's a strong character. You know, come across, just stand by your inbox. You're going to get a message from me. You know the the tag that sits with that uh, with the DA is that terrible A word, isn't it? Arrogance. <laughs> Uh, do you think it could have been, uh, it was handled in the best possible way? Look, we were faced with a chicken and egg situation here, Mike. Um, someone had to really galvanize something that had been brewing under the surface into a very concrete direction. And, and we, we, must be, we must be honest about the fact that, yes, the discussions were there about the 2024 election approaching. Um, in some cases, people didn't have confidence in coalitions, but there was no galvanizing force that actually said, okay, enough of this now. Mm. And the reality is that John Stienhuisen is the leader of the official opposition in this country. It's actually a constitutional entity. And what I think happened at Congress is someone rising to the occasion and saying, look, now we have to draw a line here. And if not the leader of the opposition, then I ask who would be actually better, to, better placed to say that we as the official opposition are putting this behind us. And we are sending a clear signal now that we are going to seriously engage you about forming this pact, that we want to move forward, we want to have these discussions, and, we, and to do so in absolutely unambiguous terms. I think that that is what came out of Congress, absolutely moving forward. It is a project that will need all of the parties involved to feel like they own it, to be involved in everything. And so that is actually the spirit in which the conversations have been taking place. Um, no one was forced to be part of this. It's a voluntary association at this point of parties exploring ways to get towards that convention. But frankly, I would say to you, the counterfactual is if someone didn't actually boldly stand up and say, it's enough of this nonsense, it's time to move forward, we may still have been in a situation where we didn't know, you know what the, the way forward would look like. Now, um, the, the interesting thing, I mean, coalitions by their very nature must be treacherous things to to uh, to to um, manage, largely because the people within your coalition are the people who want your votes. So they're kind of like frenemies, eh? Half friends, half enemies. They kind of want you, like want the the if even in the best case scenario, they want the coalition to do well, but they don't overly want their coalition partners to do better than them. So, Mike, in 2018, I wrote a book called Coalition Country, and, and this was just before this really heated up to become the topic that it is today. And this is one of the things at that stage already that I was thinking about, because there are arguments about, you know, do you get better cooperation when, when parties don't fish in the same pond, if you, if you want to use that metaphor. Um, but I think at the end of the day, given the divisions in South African society, it is so critically important that there is a foundation of shared values um, that will guide this kind of cooperation. And so that is why from the DA's point of view, we've been absolutely clear about the lessons we've learned through cooperation with the EFF, for example. It was a terrible mistake, but it was valuable because it taught us that, yes, those people may not technically be fishing in our pond, but they don't share any of the common values that we want to move South Africa forward with. So that is also why we have been clear that for this project to succeed, it actually needs to be an alternative to the ANC, not an alternative version of the ANC-style governance that we've gotten sadly used to. So if you were to involve parties like the EFF, frankly also the Patriotic Alliance, you would actually be risking a situation of creating something that is not actually better than the ANC. You are replicating some of the problems by drawing in the problematic people. And so... Yes, while it is a situation where parties will still go out who are part of the pact and compete for votes, uh, we do believe that we can have at least some rules of the game, minimum uh, ground rules to say that we don't actually expend most of our energy fighting each other. And then we all go out and actually win over more votes from the ANC and critically from disillusioned voters. 14 million South Africans are not registered to vote. 13 million are registered but don't have a reason to vote. We as a Pact and as an alternative government need to actually go out and give those people a reason to vote. For that, we don't have to fight each other. Yeah. Now, it seems that uh, within, within the coalitions that you have had, and there are a number of them, not just the ones that have got the headlines, there have been quite a few in the Western Cape that have worked really well, in KZN, 
there seems to be good partners and the good partners largely seem to be uh, those parties that are aimed at a spe specific interest group. IFP seem to go primarily for, for Zulu voters, you know, in KZN or where, wherever else they can get them. Uh, and, you know, Freedom Front Plus with a more conservative Afrikaans voter. There, there seems to be less of a contestation in those, with those partners. Problem seems to come where you're going head to head with, with parties that uh, maybe are after the same people that have been voting for the DA or would you would class as potential DA voters. Well, I think the reality is that the DA is a party with a very broad and diverse support base. So, you know, if you look at the latest figures from the Social Research Foundation, it actually indicates that uh, DA support is about a third black South Africans, a third white, and a third colored and, and Indian South Africans. So that does, you know, attest to the fact that we draw support really from a broad range of people and really from a, a, a wide geographic area. So I think it... Um, is logical that in some cases you would have increased contestation where other parties are really targeting sort of a subset of that. And I think you do see that um, playing out to some extent. But I think at the end of the day, from our point of view, uh, we offer something that frankly those other parties don't. And that is a united South Africa. And a South Africa where there's a party that actually does draw support from a very diverse range uh, of groups. And I think if you look at, you know, attitude surveys and, and what South Africans think about politics and, and especially about the idea of retreating into, into sort of lagers, um, most South Africans actually don't want that. They, they understand that we are a country uh, that is very diverse. And in order to look after my interests, the best way forward is actually if you have my back. And then I'm able to also look after your interests. And so that's why you'll find in the DA, you know, you can have um, Christians standing up for Muslims. You can have, you know, um, English people standing up for Afrikaans language rights. You know, you can have white, black, colored, Indian together. That is really the uh, differentiator that the DA offers, in addition, of course, to our governance record. So, yes, while there is fragmentation and it's a risk that we must face going forward, um, and especially in the context of coalitions, you know, we've seen overfragmentation play out. Johannesburg is a case study in overfragmentation of the vote. And so I think a lot of South Africans are seeing that. I think most South Africans want a party that's actually going to bring people together. And so that's where the fragmentation, where it does take place, is something over time that I think we'll address. You, you mentioned the diversity of the, of the DA voters or DA support and the diversity in South Africa. But isn't it now... Sort of, is that still to the? Is that still applicable to the degree that it once was? I mean, I think you've got to say at best South Africa is no longer that diverse. It's more diverse-ish. You know, we've we, we've seen a, a real sort of uh, uh, stagnation in the case of whites in the country, a decline. Indians, you know, there, there, there's also a marginal decline there, lower birth rates and so on. Coloured community still relatively strong, but we now have a, a country that's 80% black, uh, not so diverse. Eh? I think diversity is not only about numbers, to be honest. Um, I think what I'm alluding to and, what, and one of the key reasons why the DA has been very successful over the years is because it's also a mindset. It's something actually quite deep in the South African psyche of, of not being radicals. South Africa is not actually a, you know extremist society. And that's why you see parties like the EFF really struggling to grow beyond uh, the, the, the levels they've reached now. So I think South Africans, regardless of what the, you know, the, the numbers will tell you, generally feel like our country has a better shot going forward, the less division there is. And it, it makes sense if you think about our history of division. We understand what comes from division. So I think that the, the, the strength of the DA uh, in being a diverse party and in drawing diverse support has actually as much to do with the symbolic signal and the importance of actually working together as it does with the numbers themselves. Uh, it's not about quotas and, you know, dividing up and saying this, this number, you know, we've seen the race quota law that's, you know, this abomination that's come out. Um, that is social engineering and that is certainly not actually about diversity. That is about division. 
What I'm saying is we've seen for many years that many South Africans actually prefer to belong to an organization where they feel like this is something that reaches across divides. And that's what they find in the DA. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's talk about something else because um, it seems like the diversity issue, a lot of what, what um, factoring into your, to your analysis seems to be Western Cape diversity. We are currently here in Gauteng. I live in Johannesburg. It's not the same. There's diversity in Cape Town. Joburg's got different diversity, right? Yeah. In other words, you, 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 relatively speaking, you've got a far greater concentration of white people relative to the, the, the whole number in the Western Cape, especially in the, in the greater Cape Town area. Uh, you know, you've got a significant col colored population in South Africa, in Johannesburg and Gauteng, not so much. Do you think that there's a problem looming with the DA that so much of your thinking is Cape based? Well, let me start by saying that um, there is no way you can have a complete political analysis of South Africa without deeply understanding and looking at the success of the DA in the Western Cape. So when we talk about Cape Town and about the Western Cape, it is not to say that this is the only thing that matters and, you know, we, we, we are not interested in replicating it elsewhere. We talk about it because we show what we can do. At the end of the day, politics... Uh, it's easy to make promises. It's easy for people to talk. But you have to actually also judge a party on its track record. And that is where the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town are critical proof points for the DA and for voters out there. So I would actually dispute the idea that, you know, the DA's success in the Western Cape can, should wholly be an analyzed from a sort of ethnicity point of view. There are many people in that province who did not vote for the DA if you go back 20 years. And what you see there is a perfect correlation between expanding DA governance, improving what we found there from the ANC, and then more voters actually flocking into the DA. You still see that pattern, interestingly, Mike, if you look at um, going into deeper rural areas, going to the Northern Cape, the Eastern Cape, where people haven't been as exposed to the city of Cape Town, for example, or they haven't been under a DA municipality. That's where you find the contestation. But the reality is, regardless of people's ethnic background in that particular context, we have seen that as we expand our footprint and as we deliver, our support base grows. Now, here's an interesting one to maybe watch going forward. Let's look at what happens in KwaZulu-Natal in the areas around Umgeni municipality, because that is another beachhead that the DA has opened up in an area where we previously were not in power. Uh, Mayor Chris Papas and the DA team there are doing exceptional work in taking that municipality forward. And this is the kind of pattern that we want to replicate, where we then start seeing that rippling out beyond uh, Ungeni municipality. The same would apply for Midval uh, here in Gauteng. And to an extent that has happened over the years. I mean, uh, even though the coalitions have had their difficulties, th if you go and analyze actually DA support with Midval as the base and growing out, you see the same pattern. So I am confident that where South Africans give us an opportunity, whether it's at local government level, First, it doesn't matter. If we are able to deliver, we actually do then win over uh, people from widely different backgrounds because the number one thing that South Africans now want is a government that can actually fix the things that they care about. Okay, so let's talk about um, the Gauteng and the metros here, where it's been borderline catastrophic. Your first taste of power, 2016, seven years later, and... We've got cholera in uh, Chwane. We've got uh, roads that look like they've been hit by a Russian mortar fire. And for a large part of that, if not uh, certainly the bulk of the time, if one looked at it uh, on a percentage basis, the DA has been in charge. But really, and I live here, doesn't look like they've managed to move the needle in terms of governance. Yeah. So there's two, there's two things that come to mind there, Mike. The first one is... Um, really, when we talk about the motivations behind having this, this pact and this convention, it does flow from this. It flows from the fact that we understand that the way in which these coalitions have come together, collapsed, not delivered, you know, been undermined, all of those you know, horror stories, is something that needs to also be addressed in a, in a structured way. 
it's not, you, we can't just go forward and hope for the best constantly, which is, if you look at 2016, if you look at 2021, that was essentially what was going on, is that parties went out there, competed, fought with each other most of the time, opposition parties, and then hoped for the best. Now, I think everyone will agree at this point that that has not worked. What we are trying to do now is to address some of the systemic problems. So the fact that governments have to be formed within two weeks after an election is a major structural problem. So we are now already having a discussion about next year's um, election, not only nationally, but critically for Gauteng, provincially as well. What are the paths to power that we could have sitting with our partners around the table? What are the, the you know, what would, what would a provincial cabinet look like in Gauteng? What are the priorities of, of such a government? The more of those things we can sort out now, and also importantly, get parties to publicly commit to those things, the better chance we have of actually forming a stable government after next year's uh, provincial election in the case of Gauteng. Now, of course, in the city of Tswane, um, the, the, the real, I think, um, nail in the coffin came under the period of administration, a power grab by the provincial government, by the ANC in Gauteng. Now, I say that, first of all, cognizant of the great work that Mayor Silje Brink is now doing there, together with his coalition team. It's going to take time, but slowly I think people are seeing that, that this is someone who's really committed, that whole team is working hard and together. And slowly, even all of the, the, you know, the catastrophes that they are facing are starting to make progress. So I'm, I'm cognizant of that. But just imagine a situation where you didn't have a provincial government that was looming over you and constantly trying to undermine. That's what's currently the situation in a place like Tuane. That is what we can change next year. A supportive Gauteng provincial government that actually wants Tuane to succeed, that, you know, is aligned with the political values of the DA and other parties in such a provincial cabinet. So those are the things that I think we can look forward to. And the, people often talk about you must learn lessons from coalitions. You, you hear it all the time. What we are saying is this conversation around forming a pre-election pact is how you actually show that you've learned and taken the lessons on board. And that's what I hope will come out of it. Now, if one looks at your success stories, because there have been a few, and it looks like uh, Silias Brink is doing a great job in Chuan. It, it looks, looks like it. But what would you say he's doing differently to you had uh, a couple of mayors there before? Uh, some of them were even fired upwards by the looks of things. You know, they went from failed mayors to leader of, of bigger structures. But, you know, in your, you mentioned Chris Pappas. You can add Jordan Hill Lewis to, to, to the list of people doing really good work. Is this thing coming down to the individual? Mm. Uh, have we been fed a lie for too long in South Africa that anybody can do anything? Mm. Well, let me just emphasize again, you talk about a few successes. I would say it's, for, it's more than a few successes. Um, if you look at the Western Cape province, the fact that 98% of net new jobs in a particular quarter can be created in one province is something that should really make people sit up because that is the confidence that you build up over time. And that is something that benefits everyone across that province. You know, if you obviously look at basic service delivery, you mentioned, you mentioned Jordan E. Lewis in Cape Town, you know, Obviously, on a very strong foundation that has been built over, you know, 15 years of DA government, but now really harnessing that. And Cape Town's going to be the first city that beats load shedding. Cape Town is, you know, making the biggest investment in sewer infrastructure in South Africa's history. It's, it's making collectively more higher investment in um, infrastructure a lot than Joburg and, and Etiquini combined. So those are major successes. In my view, those are not some successes. Those are really demonstrations of how the DA can deliver and how critical our contribution will be at a national level and in other provinces. Now, to answer the question about individuals, this is a lesson that I think we should also look at the ANC and contrast there. Because we know that to get into positions of power in the ANC is basically a patronage game. We, we, we know that money changes hands, you know, Factional deals are made to say, you know, we'll have this person as the mayor uh, uh, as payback for something. Never mind whether that person is at all capable of, of doing the job. So the DA takes a fundamentally different approach. And I can also say to you, has really invested a lot through our uh, chair of, of uh, federal council, Helen Ziller, 
in fixing our internal processes. So we have always been serious about our selection processes to have you know, open and fair competition where we have even independent people sitting in on panels and judging the ability of whether this person would make for a good mayor. We're going to have another round of that now when we select premier candidates. So that is the way to go. However, I think it is true that we've significantly tightened up those processes because any political process is always vulnerable to, you know, sort of um, shenanigans going on there. Our processes are sound, and I think we're starting to see the fruits of that uh, in the shape of, the, you know, the people that we are putting forward for those positions. But you are absolutely right. Uh, we cannot think anymore, we cannot afford to think in this country anymore that, you know, just because someone is a politician, they can take up any executive position. I mean, we've seen what happens in national government, in local government. And certainly, we cannot just have an, have an approach where we say, it's all just a political deal. Someone's paying back someone else. And so now this person is the mayor. Look at the mayor of Johannesburg. It's a perfect example. They, said, they spoke about some kind of vetting process or, or whatever may have happened. Apparently, they missed the allegations around you know, running a Ponzi scheme. You know, and never mind the, the, you know, the, the, the individual's almost patent inability to do the job. Those are all just political deals. And we have to strike a balance between finding political solutions, but also making sure we have the right people there. And that is what the DA is showing. Okay, so this, this sort of leads into uh, the, a very thorny question, uh, because these things in South Africa matter. Uh, just every one of those success stories that we're discussing uh, shares two characteristics, white and male. And that is going to give you uh, instant, uh, it's going to give a lot of people real chest pains. Mm. You're going to have 702 complaining forever, <laughs> right? You, you know, it's going to create a massive problem down the line. It could even cost you votes. The more they do a good job, the more certain parts of, of, uh, of the country and the media will find reasons uh, to have a go at you. Look, I must say, I think the opposite is actually happening. Um, but before I talk about that, just to say that, of course, the DA has dozens of mayors across the country that are doing great work. I, I mentioned Midval, Peter Teixeira would be in that category, certainly not someone, if you had to racially profile, who you would put in the, you know, sort of white box or whatever the case may be. You know, in the Western Cape, we have mayors, the mayor of Drakenstein. We have people of diverse backgrounds in government. But also, I don't think it's correct to say that where mayors or, or DA reps are delivering, that this is somehow uh, a bad thing for the party because in those cases they happen to be of a particular race. I think actually the opposite is happening. There was interestingly a, a recent piece by, I think it was Marianne Tam at Daily Maverick, where she actually took this angle, and I think it's an unfortunate angle if we only look at you know, an executive based on, on race and gender. Uh, I, think it's, it, I think it's a bad thing for our country. But she took, that, she took that lens and then she said, but clearly these, you know, these, these leaders are succeeding. You know, John Stiernazen, Jordan E. Lewis, uh, Chris Pappas, I think were the specific people she profiled. And saying, it's interesting to note, you know, that they, they, they are white men in those cases, but they are delivering and they are proving popular. So I think the evidence that we have is uh, overwhelmingly that people in this country are desperate for delivery. And that the idea that you would rather live in misery and have someone there who you are comfortable with in terms of race, or you would have someone who's perhaps a bit out of the box, but who's actually improving your life. I think most South Africans are choosing the latter. We're seeing it in by-elections across the country, Mike. I mean, in Cape Town, we've had two by-elections um, uh, recently. And in both of those cases, most recently in an area uh, along Bloberg and those uh, sort of on the West Coast, you know, DA support growing from 80 to 94 percent precisely because the ANC stronghold has collapsed. That is because the, uh, voters from across the spectrum can see delivery from, in that case, Jordan Hill Lewis. OK, so let's move forward. Let's look at the very important election. We, uh, in my opinion, can't underst understate the importance of uh, the 2024 general election. I'm going to say it again. I think it's the most important election in the history of South Africa because so, because of all the things that are going to happen. The one is that you're going to see not one party get above 50%. Even though the ANC might get close, is, is just based on what they did in 2021, in the local government election where they got 
and they've been terrible since then. One shouldn't imagine that they're going to get more votes. Uh, you, you know, so even if they're able to still rule with, with their own tame coalition, um, South Africa is up for grabs. But you're also facing bigger threats, real threats, not the old threats of the ANC that was in decline and already sort of corrupt and things like that. And that's where, where a lot of your growth came. But there are parties that are going after your lunch. Right, you've got uh, Action SA, uh, who are focusing on not only black areas, uh, but also the white metropolitan areas or the metropolitan areas, which is where the DA has traditionally been strong. And uh, you've even got a party like the Patriotic Alliance going after a certain part of the coloured vote. What's your prognosis for uh, the DA's performance in the next, uh, uh, next general election in 2024? Let me start by saying that I agree the country's up for grabs. Um, and we don't know exactly how it will shake out, but if the ANC falls below 50% nationally, it almost by definition means that it would also have lost Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal. And that's why I keep emphasizing the provincial aspect of the Moonshot Pact discussions to make sure that we can actually build on our success in a place like KZN, where that cooperation between the DA and the IFP um, is really ground zero for what we're trying to achieve nationally. Um, and you can see a clear path to victory there where you could have a provincial government uh, constituted out of mainly those two parties. So that is very exciting. I think we shouldn't, we can't underestimate just how exciting even just that prospect is. Um, and, you know, for a long time we've had discussions about the Western Cape and how do we actually insulate it more effectively against national government failure by devolving more powers to, to the DA-led government there. But if we can win in places like KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng, you can bet that discussion is coming to a province near you, where we are then able to say, right, you know, the ANC will do nationally whatever it does. But if we are in charge of this province, how do we actually get more powers and, and insulate the people of KwaZulu-Natal, the people of Gauteng more effectively, even in a scenario where the ANC uh, does remain in power? But obviously, that is certainly not a given. And we've called it a moonshot precisely because we want to do something that's never been done before. And that is to actually remove the ANC from power, keep the EFF out and install an alternative government um, out of the pact. In terms of the threats to the DA or, or, or you know, the things that we are dealing with, um, I think it's not really only about the DA. It is about South Africa. So we have to ask some, some serious questions. The first question that we're going to have to get used to asking is, is a particular opposition party part of the pact? And if they are not, then I want to say to you, they are on the side of the ANC. We are facing a binary in this election. Because if you look at Al Jamaa, for example, here in the city of Johannesburg, if you look at good at national level with the ANC, you know, the Patriotic Alliance again, those are all parties that have already demonstrated that they're willing to side with the ANC. And the old saying goes, you know, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. So those are parties that have already demonstrated that they would turn their back on the cause of an alternative government if given the opportunity to do so. So voters are going to have to say, if a party is not part of the pact, they're not worth voting for because they ultimately may very well take your vote to be one of the small parties that helps prop up an ANC government if it gets 48%, whatever the case may be. So outside the pact, not someone you can trust. Then secondly, of course, if you look at what the pact is going to need in order to actually succeed. There is no way around the fact, first of all, that there is no pact path to power without the DA. It's going to be the biggest component of, of, of this alternative. And it is also the only component of the alternative with a proven, over a long period of time, demonstrated track record of good governance. So this is where the Western Cape is relevant because we can go back the furthest in that province and we can say, just look at the quality of the infrastructure, look at the roads, look at the electricity system, look at the fact that there's already less load shedding, look at the economic numbers, 98% of new jobs out of that province. Those are the things that are going to be critical competencies for an alternative government. And this goes back to the point you made about, can we just put anyone in any position? No, we can't. We actually now need to go and vote for a party that has demonstrated it can govern, that has the human capital to actually put people in cabinet. Now, Again, it's a bit of a, we haven't really done this in South Africa, we should do it more, but think about an alternative government. Think about a government that doesn't include the ANC and the EFF. 
which party offers you the most competent people with a demonstrated track record of actually being Minister of Finance, of being Minister of Education? That is how we need to start looking at it. And when you, when you, when you take that angle, the DA is actually your best insurance to ensure that the pact is stable because you've got a big anchor tenant there and actually able to deliver because of really the uncontested track record that the party has. I think that combination between understanding that opposition parties who are not in the pact are working against you, they are going to sell out to the ANC, combined with really the tactical voting, and we must respect voters. People you know, think further than, 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 than we sometimes give them credit for. Tactically understanding that if you want the pact to work, the DA is your best bet because it's going to bring a solid, firm, stable foundation. So um, how about we, uh, we do something that's really scary, and that is two white guys you know, talking together, and we mentioned the K-word, Kyalicha, because there's not a discussion that takes place on any form of media in South Africa that doesn't say, oh, the DA do, might do a great job in the, in the southern suburbs of Cape Town, but look at Kyalicha. Well, again, I can only refer you to the, the numbers uh, that are coming out of the administration in Cape Town. And while I obviously don't work in Cape Town, so I don't necessarily have all of them at hand, if you speak to Mayor Jordan e. Lewis, I think it's about 70% of the capital budget in the city of Cape Town is delivered this year into the poorest parts of the city. I mentioned the infrastructure investment. People think about infrastructure in economic terms, it's obviously correct. It's the foundation for economic growth. But infrastructure is also a key aspect if you want to live a dignified life. If you live in an area without sewerage networks uh, or, or running water, that, those are infrastructure issues that actually make you live an undignified life. And as I said, the investment, primarily 70% into poor areas, uh, that Cape Town is making is bigger than Joburg and Etiquini's combined. So that's what's going into those, into those um, areas. But the reality is that we still have so much work to do. And we know the numbers of impoverished people coming to Cape Town because they know this is where they'll have a better opportunity. People vote with their feet long before they actually vote you know, with, with the X. And we're going to have to really accelerate delivery to actually deliver and cater for a city that is you know, not only already facing backlogs, but that is growing at a rapid rate. Um, but it is through these kind of investments that I'm talking about. The 10-year infrastructure plan that the mayor has put on the table in Cape Town. Um, the sewer upgrade now, the biggest in South African history. Those are the things that over time improve the dignity of people living in the poorest areas. And we make no bones about it. We want, we want Cape Town to be a city of hope for all its residents. Because we believe that Cape Town, if we get it right over the next few years, can actually be a beacon of what South Africa can be. A city that's run by an honest, competent government that delivers for all, that, that upgrades areas that need it, but don't view ratepayers as enemies either. We must understand that that's also important because the rate basis is always going to be the foundation for your delivery in areas where people can't afford to pay rates. That is the approach that Cape Town has put on the table. Yes, we live with the same legacy of apartheid that every other country, uh, every other part of this country does. But if you look at all the metrics, access to basic services, it's by far the highest in the Western Cape. And over time, the compound effect is going to be visibly clear for everyone to see. Dr. Leon Shriver, thank you so much for joining us today. You're going to have your work cut out speaking to some of your uh, potential coalition pact uh, partners. Uh, I've mentioned it many times on this channel. I wish you had to come up with a better name than the Moonshot Pact. Maybe it changes. Uh, but uh, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much to Dr. Leon Shriver, to everybody that's joined us today. Thank you so much for doing that. We look forward to seeing you in the next State of the Nation. If you haven't subscribed yet to the channel, please do so. Pleasure, Leon Mike. Leon Shriver, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks.